Welcome to the Calvary Baltimore Weekly Sermon. Here's today's teaching. I'd like to turn your attention this morning to the first chapter of Luke. Luke. What'd you say? That's a revelation. That's a revelation. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Uh, so I really wanted to spend, um, you know, before we get started, I understand that we normally start five or 10 or 15 minutes later than we should every Sunday. And I apologize. I really do my best to honor your time. It's a way of showing respect for you guys by being uh, on time. However, I, as a, you got to put yourself in my shoes, right? I, I'm here to do the work of the ministry. And sometimes I get caught up talking to people. Uh, and it, it's silly to me to hurry that up so that I can do the work of the ministry. So I, 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 if I run late, uh, it's just because I'm in the middle of something else. So thank you. I need a little grace. A little. I'm here to love who God puts in front of me. And sometimes it takes a while to get here, but we get there eventually. Uh, everyone but him, Lord. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, uh, I, I wanted to spend this morning uh, looking at the, that's my dad, by the way, if anyone doesn't know, uh, looking at the song of Mary this morning, the Magnificat. Uh, now, heading into today's study, I feel I should address something uh, that is uh, that Protestants can get a little antsy or nervous whenever a high view of Mary presents itself. And, of course, Protestants get nervous about this because of how the Catholic Church venerates Mary. They pray to her. They say she's the mediator of, uh, to, to Jesus. Uh, they go to Mary as a means of grace. And so Protestants, uh, maybe rightfully so, can get a little, Ooh, I hope this doesn't take an inappropriate turn. But us Protestants claim to be biblical. And if we're going to be biblical, of course we shouldn't worship Mary, but we should recognize that the scriptures do speak very highly of Mary. It speaks very warmly and favorably of her. In the scriptures, she is a archetype. She's a type of Sarah or Rachel or even a type of Abraham, as Abraham is the father of many nations. Mary is the mother of the king of the nations. Uh, she is the woman spoken about all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. From her womb would come one that would crush the head of the serpent. And so for some of you coming out of the Catholic Church, this may be a message that you're tempted to be on edge uh, because Rome uh, states that the church has always believed in high exaltations of Mary and the perpetual virginity of Mary, which is not true. She had many more kids. They speak of the sinlessness of Mary. They say that Mary ascended into heaven, uh, but the early church did not believe this. It took, quite a, it took a few hundred years for this to take predominance. The, the, uh, and my, so my point is, if we can read this story biblically and, and let Rome be Rome and let's just lock into the Bible, uh, we can see that Mary is a redeemed, faithful servant of Christ. She's the mother of our Lord. And again, we should not worship or pray to her, but at the same time, she is someone the Bible speaks very highly of and someone we should learn from. Uh, and uh, as a side footnote here and as a question, who is the incarnation story really about anyways? <laughs> Are these stories to magnify Mary or stories to magnify Jesus? Well, of course, it's Jesus. We have to remember, Luke and Matthew did not give us these stories for the glory of Mary, but for the glory of Christ. Advent is to be Christological, not Mariological. So let's dive into Luke 1 today. Let's put the emphasis where the emphasis is due. And we're actually going to get a running start all the way down in verse 26 and that's Luke 1. So for those of you used to me teaching two verses on a Sunday, this is going to be a real mind bender. We got like 30 some verses today. We're going to be here till Christmas. Um, <clears throat> verse 26. <clears throat> Kidding, I hope. Uh, in the sixth month, uh, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Wouldn't that be a trip? 
An angel appears before you in the Aramaic. It's literally, hi. <laughs> you imagine an angel shows up in your living room. You're about to drink your first cup of coffee. Hi, favored one. Uh, 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 <laughs> I'd take that first sip, make sure I wasn't delirious. Uh, but she was greatly troubled at his saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Two things can be true at once. Mary is the recipient of God's grace, and Mary is a good woman. In many ways, she is the opposite of Eve. Remember, Eve is introduced in disobedience. Here, Mary is introduced as an obedient servant to God. Uh, and fun fact, in Matthew, when Mary's husband, uh, Joseph, believed Mary was in sin, Joseph acted the opposite of Adam. Instead of vocalizing his displeasure, remember it says he quietly tried to divorce his wife. So uh, there's some pretty cool connections there. Verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, Mary asks, rightfully so, how is this possible? Uh, and that's a logical question. Uh, verse 34, And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So, pause. The author of this gospel, Luke, wrote two different books in our Bible. Luke wrote the book uh, of Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts. And one of the helpful ways into understanding those books is to understand that Luke and Acts are two volumes of the same work. There are questions raised in Luke that are answered in Acts, and things in Acts that are originally brought up in Luke. And fascinatingly, the book of Acts opens with the story of Pentecost, with the Holy Spirit descending uh, upon the 120 in the upper room. Well, here we are in volume one in the gospel according to St. Luke, and the Holy Spirit is descending upon who? Upon Mary. And really fascinating, in, a in Acts at Pentecost, the people were filled with the Spirit of Christ. And here in Luke, Mary is filled with the child and the person of Christ. Now that's, I think, really cool. But what I find really fascinating is that the story of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 reads similarly to the Holy Spirit depending up, descending upon the tabernacle in the wilderness. If you read the tabernacle, the Spirit descending upon in, in, in the Pentateuch, and then read Acts chapter 2, you go, oh, they're connected. We are the temple of God as the church, right? And, but this is almost exactly how Mary's pregnancy is described. That the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow her and God is going to make the most holy place inside of her womb. Elizabeth is going to speak of Mary's womb in garden terms, which makes sense because inside the temple and the tabernacle was designed to look like the Garden of Eden. But uh, is describing uh, to, to Mary, again, Elizabeth is not describing the glory of Mary. He's describing uh, the glory of the one who's going to be in her womb. This is not to magnify Mary. This is talking about what God has done. Remember the tabernacle uh, in the wilderness was a tent made by human hands and was clothed in animal skins. Uh, now the same God who descended into that tabernacle is going to uh, be in tabernacle with men inside of Mary's womb. And then later in the upper room at Pentecost. Uh, now, just as a fun note here, you didn't need to know this, but I was really excited about it. Mary and Joseph were from the region of Galilee, specifically Nazareth. Now, to the Jewish people, the north, Galilee, was the worst part of the country. You don't go to Galilee. That's if you were, if you flew in, don't, don't go to Galilee, right? It'd be like a friend who wants to come to Maryland, don't go to the Baltimore City, right? You would tell them certain places to avoid. Well, the place to avoid was Galilee. Uh, and to help give you an idea, uh, if Jesus, uh, and, and, and not just Galilee, he was born in Nazareth, which was the worst part of Galilee. 
It was the poorest, most backwoods part of Galilee. To put this into today's perspective, if Jesus was born today as an American, and boy, that would USA, USA, that'd be something else. But imagine he came and was born to a poor country girl in West Virginia, to a poor country girl deep in, in Louisiana and had a Creole accent. There are places in the gospel where people could hear Jesus' accent, Matthew 26, 73, and derided him because he sounded like a hillbilly. He sounded like, a, so imagine, next time you read the uh, Sermon on the Mount, imagine a Creole accent or uh, a thick Appalachian accent. And people made fun, the, the scholars of Jerusalem picked on him. And my point is, when the father wanted to choose a womb to place his only begotten son, he did not choose a family who lived in a palace. He chose the womb of a little country bumpkin, likely 12 to 14 year old girl from the most despised part of Israel to the most despised town in the most despised part of Israel. And as we get into the Magnificat, this theme of her amazement that God chose her of all people is gonna really bleed through. So verse 36, we're gonna keep rolling. You're never gonna hear the Sermon on the Mount the same, are you? <laughs> nice Southern draw in there. Uh, <laughs> and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary is not only willing, she's wanting for God to do this. Uh, now it is from here we get the story of Mary visiting Elizabeth. We're moving, verse 39. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Jude, uh, Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard this, the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And uh, imagine, Elizabeth's about 90. Can you imagine what that did to her frame? Oh, she's six months pregnant, no less. And Elizabeth uh, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she acclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And this is why, uh, and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Mary's womb is a type of holy of holies. Jesus, who is God, is now residing inside of her. And with this in mind, John leaping makes even more sense because that word leap is a very specific word. Uh, it's a word that's similar to what we read in 2 Samuel 6, 16. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, uh, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. You remember that story? And then she makes fun of him and he curses her womb. Uh, well, like David leaped and danced before the Ark of the Covenant, which resided in the Holy of Holies, representing God's throne, so John is now leaping and dancing before Jesus, our Lord. John, verse 32, is the son of David, or, or uh, sorry, <laughs> Jesus, verse 32, is the son of David, who is also God. Uh, what we would read in Latin is Jesus is vera homo, vera deus. He is truly God, and he is truly man. He is both God and man completely, and John dances before Jesus like David does before the ark. It's almost as if the Ark of the Covenant is in Mary's womb and it has been brought to Elizabeth's house. And so she leaps, John leaps and dances before it as a priest of our God, a prophet of our God. Uh, now verse 34, or 44. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. The angel's prophecy has now been confirmed by two witnesses. It's been confirmed by Elizabeth, and it's been confirmed by John. And now Mary is going to be so moved, and might I add, John was the first one to bear testimony of Jesus' divinity, which I find fascinating when you continue on in the story. But now Mary gets so filled up. You ever get... I wasn't going to say this, but here we are. You ever spend time around toxic people? Hopefully no one in this room. And then you start to think like them. 
And then you start to like them. And then you start to only communicate through anger like them. Sooner or later, you can't even speak without cursing like them. You've, your language has diminished, and slowly you become yourself toxic. But if, at the same time, you ever spend time around people that make you better? Here Mary is with someone who is making her better. These girls are making each other better, which is what the church is supposed to do. We are to encourage each other to both love and good works. Right? And so here... Mary has spent time with Elizabeth and now she came in a hurry and now she's so filled up by being with her cousin, with a good godly family. She now bursts into song, which I love. Uh, So verse 46, and this is where we were getting today, the Magnificat. Verse 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. That word magnify literally means to engulf or to enlarge, like me at a buffet table. Nothing safe. No, I, uh, uh, Mary's whole soul becomes so filled. That just came out. Mary's soul, I didn't plan that at all. Mary's soul becomes so consumed with what God's doing in her life. She becomes almost bubbled over. You ever see a cup with too much water in it? It just, she's bubbling over. She's engulfed in the goodness of God. She says, my soul magnifies. It's engulfed uh, by the Lord. Uh, Verse 47, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Uh, Without Getting too far into this, Mary's using Hebrew parallelism. Uh, Verse 46 and 47 belong together, that both her soul and her spirit are engulfed in a joy over what God is doing. And I believe every Christian, I hope anyways, has experienced this at some point in their life. There's a point when the Spirit of God is moving that you realize that his favor has come upon you. And we become so grateful and so joyful in it. Honestly, isn't it astounding? God loves me. (laughs) And I can tell you, loved ones, like everyone in this room, we've all had some dark days, times of sorrow, but the believer always bounces back. How? Because of God's loving favor upon us. He loves you. He cares for you. The knowledge of God's grace always brings us back to worship, back to praise. You have to understand joy in the scriptures. It says the joy of the Lord is our strength. If you lose your joy, you've lost your strength. The the, the spirit produces this joy. And joy in scripture is not, not a suggestion. It's a command. Christians are commanded to be joyful. Now, as Paul would say, we're sorrowful yet always rejoicing. That doesn't mean you're never in the dump some days because believe me, Satan runs this ball of earth and it's terrible. But a Christian always comes back. Remember what we, when we went through Psalm 23? God does not rest us in the valleys. He walks us through them. And here Mary is so blown away at the goodness of God. And notice that her praise is not on her worthiness, but it belongs to the one who is worthy, who is greater than her. And a real faith produces real worship. Worship that glorifies God and not self. And personally, this is one of the reasons when I I, I listen to pastors sometimes, I check in on who's really popular right now. And, and whenever I hear a pastor and he sounds arrogant, I get so turned off. That's something just, it's like, oh, God, get this out of here. Because to draw near to God, it is so humbling. You will never read of anyone in the scripture on fire for God consumed with themselves. They are on their knees. The tears and boogers are flying out their face. They're pleading before God to do what he needs to do. It's so humbling. The closer we get to God, the smaller we realize we are. And she's so consumed. She's describing her soul and her spirit being overcome by the glory of God. She's diminishing as Christ is magnifying 
in her life. Now verse 48. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. In verse 46 through 49, Mary is absolutely blown away at God's love for her. She's amazed that all of the people throughout all of time that God could have chosen to give birth to the Messiah, that he chose her. And again, I believe this is a feeling, again, at least I hope, that most believers have experienced in here. That God, of all the people you could have saved, you chose me. You chose me. I hope you're seeing a theme here. There is no room for arrogance in the kingdom. What did Jesus say? The way to enter in first in the kingdom are the poor in spirit. God, before you, I'm nothing. And here, Mary is essentially saying, you've chosen me? Every single blessing in all of our lives, if we're humble enough, can be reduced to this thought. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Did you notice that Mary is not thinking in any way that this was due to her? (laughs) She knows it's all of God's grace. You know, I was at a Christmas party last week, and uh, I behaved myself. You're welcome. Uh, My pants stayed on. I... uh, Woo! No, no, lampshade on the head, nothing crazy. I just had a, ate too much. I ate, they had meatballs there, those suckers. I cleaned them out. Uh, <laughs> I did. No cow is safe in my presence. Uh, and I was, I was talking to a non-believer there. We talked for three hours, me and this guy, about creational grace. Uh, and that it was by the grace of God that we were born in the good families. A lot of people don't have that. It's by the grace of God I had an opportunity to go to a good school. A lot of people don't have that. Most people don't have that. And I got to talk about how grateful we should be at what God had chosen for us before we were even born, where he chose to put us, and where he, by who he chose to put us with. It was a very humbling conversation, at least it was for me. I don't know what he thought. Uh, You know, but we're told in the scriptures that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Every good thing you have is from the Lord. Everything. You woke up today without a blinding migraine? That was a gift from the Lord. (laughs) you, You know, you walked here today. You had food in your belly. We have a warm place to go. Your car started. It's all a gift from the Lord. From our stuff to our salvation. We have this really nasty habit of attributing eternity to God, but leave out everything getting there. It's all from him. And when the spirit of God is moving in the life of of the believer, we're truly amazed at that. If we can get our own egos out of the way, if we can break the idol of self... We can, we can then really enter into being truly humble at the glory of God. And for people that have come from nothing, it seems to be easier. And Mary comes from nothing. And she sees these blessings and she knows exactly who it is from. It's all the Lord. And Mary also points out that God is both mighty and holy. I like that. Mighty not in the sense, I mean, it's not like, you know, my kids... You know, we'll do a little flex off, and they're like, wow, Dad's so strong. And I am, uh, but not every, not every son gets a model for a father, uh, you know, and delusional. Uh, I look like I should be guarding a bell tower at this stage of my life. Uh, but <laughs> where was I? What was I going on about I was imagining myself as a hunchback, right? Um, no, here we go. There we go. We're getting it. Uh, <laughs> but mighty in the sense that God can do whatever he wants. Who's ever heard of a virgin bearing a child before? But God's mighty enough to break the laws of nature. 
because he wrote those laws. If God wants you to accomplish something, there is nothing that can stop you. That's what that mighty means. If God wants to save your children and he wants to use you to do it, there's nothing Satan can do to stop you. That's what that mighty means. When God's called you, who can break that? Nothing. And she looks, she has defied what is how every person in humanity since Adam and Eve have been born. God says, nah, not this time. And he's mighty enough to do it. But he is also holy. I really want to preach this, but we don't have time. But let me just say this, that God is separate. He's other than. There is no one like our God. No one can do what he can do. He is utterly separate then. He is superlative in all his nature. And God is not only holy. He's holy, holy, holy. He's separate, separate, separate. It's called the trishagion, that there is none beside him on every conceivable metric. He is greater than. And again, she just is consumed with the glory of God. Verse 50, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Fear of the Lord is a theme throughout the entire scriptures. Um, And fear of the Lord means to have a deep reverence for God. To have an awe or an adoration of, of God. And I want to make sure we're thinking about this properly. To have a healthy fear of the Lord is a fear that does not run from God. Now, I grew up, uh, when I was in my 20s, there was, uh, television mattered a whole lot more back then. I don't even have cable anymore. Uh, but there was this show that overtook the world called the Jersey Shore. Anyone remember that? wonderful piece of art and uh, <laughs> there was this scene there's this guy named Ron and he was drinking all the time and acting a fool and, but he grew up Catholic and he said something to the effect of if I stepped in the church right now I'd burst into flames or uh, I, I'd get struck by a lightning bolt and I remember reflecting on that he had a fear of the Lord but it wasn't a healthy fear of the Lord It was the Genesis 3 fear that hid, that didn't confront God with their problems. But a healthy fear of the Lord is a fear that runs to God. Remember the parable of the tax collector? He stood a far way off from the temple and he said, Lord, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. And what did God say? Surely that man went home justified. The only way to receive God's mercy is to fear him. To come to God in reverence. How does Jesus instruct his church how to pray? Our Father, holy. As God's people, we must have a deep reverence for God and approach God in a respectful manner. To approach him as one would a godly father or or, or king. And then Mary says that his mercy is for those who fear him. And so, loved ones, please hear me. Because this not only applies to you, this applies to others. Without reverence, there is no mercy. I want you to think about the ramifications of what Mary is saying. Without reverence, there is no mercy. As Mary says, and his mercy is for those who fear him. That there is something that has been true from generation to generation for all of time. That the Lord is merciful to those who have a reverence, a respect for him. You know, this is one of the reasons, you know, I, I preach on the attributes and the holiness of God all the time and regularly. Because our culture seems to have no reverence for anything. There's no reverence for our history. There's no reverence for our country. This week, I don't want to get into it, but there's no reverence for the Senate room. There's no reverence for our Bibles. There's no reverence for church. There's no reverence for presidents. There's no reverence, and this spills into our relationship with God. Mary is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Mary is rightly declaring that we must approach God in a humble adoration. 
and humility and reverence for who God is. Loved ones, as good as God is to us and his people, uh, if, if, if God's grace or mercy or loving kindness faltered for just one second for you, you would be consumed by a ball of fire because of his just wrath. If God for one second said, I'm going to treat them like they deserve, you would be in so much trouble. Because we are irreverent by nature. We all like sheep have gone astray in the best of men are men at best. And every single person in this room is 100% dependent upon God's mercy for our survival. And not just survival today, but eternity too. We all are in, the, in a deep need for God's mercy. And that mercy is for those who fear him. Who come to Jesus Christ and abide in him. What does Psalm 2, chapter, what does Psalm 2 say? Kiss the son lest you perish on the way. If you have never gotten on your knees and cried out to God... I beg you to do that today. Because mercy is for those who fear him. If you know if you stand before God Almighty today and you are in trouble, then the only way to not be in trouble <laughs> is to come in fear to him. And mercy will be there for you. Verse 51. And he has shown great strength with his arm and he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones that exalted those of humble estate. Mary sings of two things, of how God brings low the proud, but also elevates the lowly. Remember what the scriptures say in Malachi 3, 6. I love what Dr. Frank says, the Italian prophet, Malachi. Uh, <laughs> I had meatballs on the brain, so I... Uh, <laughs> for I, the Lord, do not change. You know God says that? There's nothing you're going to say to him that makes him go, I never thought of that. <laughs> you're right, you should be able to sin today. <laughs> or in Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is why we study the scriptures. Because the same God that killed Goliath is the same God helping you with your tax returns. The same God who defeated the Amalekites is the same God helping you with your issues. Mary knows what God has done, so she knows what God will do. Because he is the same and he changes not. But if we study our scriptures, we also know that God has no patience for the arrogant. Not long-suffering patience anyways. And he humbles. Pride comes before the fall. He humbles the proud. But consistently throughout the scriptures, he elevates the lowly. Now there's two ways to lowliness. <laughs> you either bring yourself low or he brings you low. So go to your knees and watch how he promotes you. I'm not a prosperity preacher. I don't believe in it. But if we're being biblical, he elevates the lowly. Verse 53. He's filled the hungry with good things. And he has sent, and the rich he has sent away empty. Think of a person as a cup, Matthew 23, 26, 2 Timothy 4, 6. If your cup is already full, Romans 5, 5, where is God's love to be poured? If you came here this morning all knowing, what's God going to teach you today? If you came in here today with a case of, I'm fine. <laughs> you know that when someone says, how are you doing? And you just don't want to get into it. So you go, oh, I'm great. No, you're not. <laughs> We're all going through something. If you came in here today, oh, the I'm fines. I'm all filled up. What's God going to fill you with today? Family, one of the reasons God brings us to the end of ourselves, uh, 
or allows trials is to empty our cups so he may fill us with better things. Remember, it is when we are weak that we are made strong and it is in our emptiness. That is when God fills us with great things. Yeah, think about the wedding of Cana. The good wine didn't come until the other wine was gone. And Mary knows this. She knows her future was destined for obscurity. She knows she was destined for a hard life, being poor of the poor of the poor country girl. And the Lord saw an empty cup and he decided to fill it with praise and joy and his own son. And isn't this a window into all of our conversions? It's when we finally come to the end of ourselves that we call out to God and he fills us with his spirit. He begins to change us and to fill us up with better things. We begin to speak differently, don't we? We begin to think differently. Not so cynical. That's nice. We learn to love differently. Verse 54. He has helped to serve in Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. God, God's mercy is active. It's not passive. It is a mercy that reaches into the lives of his people, Lamentations 3.22, every day. God's mercy is here for you every day. Verse 56, we've got to keep moving. And Mary reminded, or remained with her about three months and returned to her home. I'd like to close with a brief concluding thought. Like Mary, through faith, did you know Christ now lives in you through his spirit? I don't want to say you're pregnant because that might freak some of you out, but. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a way to not talk about if I eat too much, I can get man boobs and then to start that whole product, I'm going to just avoid the whole thing and there I go. Uh, uh, like Mary, through faith, Christ now lives inside of you. This story should ring some bells as we think about this in a New Testament context. And like Mary, we should also be blown away at the generosity and the mercy of our God. You should be blown away that God lives in you. Because he does. Paul goes on about this, remember? The same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is alive in you. The same God that said, let there be light, and there was. There was. Lives in you. We should be blown away. That God Almighty looked down upon his creation, and of all the people he could have chosen, he chose you. He chose you. It's incredible. Exodus 33, 19 says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. God did not owe you anything. If there are 10 people lined up in a row, and God says to five of them, hmm, I'm going to let you into heaven. He says to the other five, no, nah, I don't think so. Is he unjust? No. Because the question isn't, how come anyone goes to hell? The real question is, how come any of us go to heaven? And he had mercy on us. He loves us. It's astounding. God didn't make, need to make any of us an object of his grace. He had no obligation to save you. He had no obligation to make sure you were in a Bible-believing church. And yet, here you are. And traditionally, every year the church all over the world gathers in December and remembers what the birth of this child, Jesus, means. And it means that humanity desperately needed God's mercy. That we are all sinners, that we are all fallen, and we are all broken. If you haven't realized that about yourself, you have not been humbled, and it's coming. <laughs> and so God looked down from heaven, and in his mercy, he did not nuke us, but he sent his only begotten son, and Jesus in this story is the size of a cashew. And already the prophets are dancing. 
and he took on human flesh. And Jesus took on human flesh so that he may save humanity as one of us. That this son was both fully man and fully God, and as God, he was perfect. And as man, he could justify us through his blood, through his righteousness. He could be what we should have been. A God-man who would be the new and better Adam. And he would reverse the curse from Genesis 3 and he would defeat the serpent that they should have defeated. And the story of the incarnation is the story of God's mercy and grace upon humanity. He looked down upon us lowly creatures and in his good and perfect nature. What does God do with the lowly? He elevates And one day he will elevate us to a place where we will sit on thrones beside of him. It says, Paul tells us, we will even judge the angels. This is what Christ has done for us. And we too should be filled with wonder and praise. I I truly believe that. We should become so captivated by the goodness of our God. And like Mary, in light of God's mercy and grace, We should not seek to magnify ourselves, but seek to magnify the one who magnifies us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you that this did not take an hour and a half. So praise you. We, uh, We thank you, God, for our family. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the love and the spirit that you've placed in here. There is not one good person in this room. Only people who belong to a good and merciful God. And he changes our character into being lovely as he is lovely. Who we really are by nature, it's very ugly. So God, we ask that you would break us of ourself. That you would bring us low in humility and adoration and reverence of you so that you may fill us up with newer and better things and elevate us, God. Put us in positions and even in high places so that we may serve you and change. Take back some of this madness that's around us. Like Joseph, God, give us favor and keep us humble. We pray for those in here who do not know you, God. Maybe they... Maybe today is the day of their salvation. Well, that begins with a fear of the Lord. Let them come to you, Father, today in mercy for salvation through your only begotten Son. That whoever believes in him and his cross will not perish but have everlasting life. And God, we pray for those who are weary and tired in here. God, we pray that for those of us that are low, God, it is not a sinful low. It is not a low set in despair or defeated from the snares and the arrows of the enemy. Pick up and bind the wounded, God, and help them to be righteously low. God, humble, because those who are humble in you, God, will find strength. Please be with us now. Guide and direct us now. Send us out. Uh, into our families and work and communities, God, and help us to magnify you and all that you've done. And let us truly and genuinely, God, in both heart and, and my, uh, heart and head, God, be so overcome and ma- <laughs> consumed with what you're doing with us, we pray. And in Jesus' name, all of God's people said, amen. Let's stand and worship. That's today's message from Calvary Baltimore. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to know more about us, visit calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Our email address is calvarybaltimore1 at gmail.com. To financially support the work God is doing through Calvary Baltimore, go to calvarychapelbaltimore.org and click Give. And if you're in the area, stop by on a Sunday morning. For directions and service times, go to our website at calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Live streams and weekly sermons are available on our website, our Facebook page, and YouTube. You can also watch with our mobile app and on Apple TV and Roku. 
Search for Calvary Chapel Baltimore on these platforms for instant access to great Bible teaching and encouragement. We hope you've been blessed by this week's teaching. Until next time, as Pastor Josh says, study the Word to live the Word to share the Word. And join us again for the next Calvary Baltimore Weekly Sermon.